Well, good morning and Merry Christmas. <clears throat> if you could see what I can see right now, it's a sight. This is great. Uh, you'll remember last year we had to cancel our Christmas service because of the snow, so this is my first uh, Christmas service worshiping with all of you together, and it, uh, it's a thrill and a joy. So I want to invite you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, last week we looked at Isaiah chapter 7, and this week we're going to look at Isaiah 9 and the prophecy there. As I studied chapters 1 through 8 of Isaiah leading up to this ninth chapter, I was really amazed by the similarities of ancient Israel that ancient Israel has with modern America. In modern America, we have absolutely rejected God. Our universities like Harvard and Princeton and Yale, which were once bastions of truth and seminaries, are now bastions for the enemy. We have lost our conscience. We are no longer ashamed. Church attendance in the United States, we, this is well known, is at an all-time low causing many people to refer to America, labeling it as, quote, post-Christian. And in rejecting God, we have despised him. And in despising God, we are estranged from him, not reconciled to him. And this is what we find in Israel, ancient Israel. In chapter 1, verse 4, Isaiah says to them, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly, they have forsaken the Lord, just like our country, rejected the Lord, forsaken the Lord. They have, and then it says, despised the Holy One of Israel, and then it says, they are utterly estranged. Forsaken, despised, and now estranged from God. Amazingly, even though we could label this country almost post-Christian in many ways, it doesn't add up and doesn't make sense because there are churches everywhere. We recently went on a trip to Florida, and on our trip down to Florida, I was amazed at how many churches I saw just in a small town. There'd be like eight or nine churches that you'd pass. They are everywhere. We have Christian bookstores. We have Christian radio. We have Christian TV, Christian entertainment, Christian movies, Christian coffee shops, Christian restaurants, Christian comedians, Christian podcasts, Christian news programs. And so the question is, if Christianity saturates the United States of America, why are we so spiritually anemic? Well, the problem isn't that America doesn't worship. The problem is how we worship. We don't worship rightly. Churches in our land literally blaspheme Christ by re-sacrificing him. We have gay-affirming churches that the only reason for their gathering is to advance their agenda. We have seeker-sensitive churches where the goal is to entertain and to not offend. And even a church like ours can fall into the trap of heartlessly just going through the motions. Our problem isn't that America doesn't worship. The problem is that we don't worship according to spirit and truth. We don't worship rightly. Israel, same situation. Listen to what Isaiah says in verse 11. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of your worship. Bring no more vain offerings. You're a burden to me. I am wary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. I can't receive your worship because you hate one another, God said to them. Empty worship, rejection of God. Thirdly, thirdly, corruption at every level of society. The United States is corrupt at every level of its society. In the government, congressmen, presidents, both parties are corrupt. The judicial branch, our judges, our courtrooms, our colleges, and the presidents of those colleges, the professors of those colleges, 
trying to turn the hearts of the young people of America away from God and his truth. Schools, elementary schools, promoting the LGBTQ agenda. The medical and pharmaceutical industry, the CDC, corrupt. Large corporations, corrupt. And the result of all of this corruption is the exploitation of the weak here in America. Oh, well, it's the same thing in Israel. Isaiah says in chapter 1, verse 23, your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe. And everyone runs after gifts. Talking about the leaders, they love bribes, they love gifts. They do not bring justice to the fatherless, and the widow's cause does not come to them. Fourthly, like Israel, we are steeped in idolatry. Entertainment, technology, phones. But in particular, I want to name a few areas. Number one and number two, money and military. Money and military. We are proud of our wealth in America. We are proud of our wealth. And we are proud of our military might. Now, it's nothing new. Listen to what Isaiah said to Israel in chapter 2, verses 7 through 8. Their land is filled with silver and gold. Wow, Israel was rich at this time, apparently. Their land was filled with silver and gold, and there is no end to their treasures. Their land is filled, secondly, listen, with horses, and there is no end to their chariots. He's talking about their army. They have built up their army, they have built up their wealth, and they trust in their wealth, and they trust in their military might, and they look to those things rather than me, thus says the Lord. And then he says, their land is filled with idols, they bow down to the work of their hands, to what their own fingers have made. And I would add, as a third thing of idolatry, is sexual immorality We are proud not only of our wealth, we are proud not only of our military might, we are proud of our sexual immorality here in our nation. We are of a society of seduction in entertainment, in commercials, in our schools, the way kids dress, social media. We parade it, we don't hide it, we literally have parades. Isaiah 3, 4. They proclaim their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. There used to be a time in our nation where at least people had the conscience to hide things. That is not the case anymore. Speaking of the women of Israel, Isaiah says this in chapter three, the Lord said, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks, glancing lustfully with their eyes, mincing along as they go, tinkling with their feet. Therefore the Lord will strike with a scab the heads of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will bear their secret parts. And in that day, the Lord will take away the finery of the anklets, the headbands, the crescents, the pendants, the bracelets, the scarves, the headdresses, the amulets, the sashes, the perfume boxes, the amulets, the signet rings, the nose rings, the feastal robes, the mantles, the cloaks, the handbags, the mirrors, the linen garments, and the veils. We are a society of seduction in the United States of America. Just like ancient Israel. Fifthly, we are ruled by foolish and wicked rulers. We are ruled by foolish and wicked rulers. I don't need to give you examples of this. (laughs) You know. Why do we have foolish and wicked rulers, though? Is it because we voted them in? Well, you could say that. Here's what John Calvin says in his Institutes of the Christian Religion in Book 4, Chapter 20. He says, quote, They who rule unjustly and incompetently have been raised up by God to punish the wickedness of the people. And then he says this, A wicked king is the Lord's wrath upon a nation. He raised them up. God is the one who says in his word that he raised up Pharaoh. And he says in the book of Daniel that he raised up Nebuchadnezzar. And then he says in the book of Isaiah that he raised up Cyrus. God is the one who raises these men up as judgments upon the nations. And that's what Isaiah says to Israel in chapter 3, verse 4. He says, and I will make boys their leaders. And infants shall rule over them. My people... Infants are their oppressors, and women rule over them. 
O oh, my people, your guides mislead you, and they have swallowed up the course of your paths. Notice what the text says. It says, I will make, I will make boys their princes. Foolish and wicked leaders aren't there just because they've made bad decisions or we've made bad decisions. They are there as the judgment of God. Sixthly, and finally, we have killed and sacrificed our own children. We have killed and sacrificed our own children through abortion, of course, which we know. It's a Holocaust unlike any other in the history of the world, 63 million infants dead. Well, guess what? Israel sacrificed and killed their own children. God warned them not to do this way back in the time of Moses in the book of Leviticus. He said, do not offer your children to Moloch because he knew hundreds of years down the road that is exactly what they were going to do. And guess who started it all? Solomon. Solomon started the sacrifice of children. And then King Ahaz, the king that Israel is prophesying to, that Isaiah is prophesying to, he picked the practice back up. And that's described in 2 Chronicles chapter 28, verses 1 through 3. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign. 20 years. No offense to 20-year-olds here, but you're not ready to rule and reign over a country. And he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He made offerings in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burned his children as an offering according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. He literally sacrificed his children. Why? Why? Why would people sacrifice their children, whether it's modern America or ancient Israel? It is because they believe that if they don't sacrifice them, then their lives will not be good. And they believe that if they do sacrifice them, it will enhance their lives. That's why people have abortions. And that's why they sacrificed their children to the pagan gods, because they thought that if they sacrificed their children to the pagan gods, then the pagan gods would be appeased and their lives would be better better. So we sacrifice our children, and as a result, listen, we live in a land of darkness. This is a land of darkness. Don't let the commercials fool you with all the joy. This is a land of darkness, and we are under the judgment of God, and there is now a horrific divide between God and man, where God is righteously angry at man and man is unrighteously angry at God. Listen to what Isaiah says. They have rejected, chapter five, verses 24 through 25, they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people and he stretched out his hand against them and struck them. And then a few chapters later in chapter eight, verses 21 through 22, they will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their God. They're gonna sin, I'm gonna punish them That's going to make them angry, and then they're going to curse God and speak contemptuously against me and turn their faces upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. That's the end of Isaiah chapter 8. This is the absolute low point in the history of Israel where they have fallen to idolatry and rejected their God, full of corruption, killing their children, ensuing judgment. That's the end of Isaiah chapter 8, which is why Isaiah chapter 9 is so absolutely shocking. (laughs) Because when you read Isaiah chapter 9, the Lord says, all of that's going to change. All of that's going to get better. We're going to go, number one, the Lord is going to bring Israel from shame for their sin and rebellion, from shame to glory. It's point number one in your notes. From shame to glory. Look at verse one with me in chapter nine. Look at what the Lord is going to do for Israel. Despite their rebellion, despite their hard-heartedness, look at what he's going to do. Verse one, but there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. 
In the former time, he brought into contempt, meaning shame, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea. That's where they live, along the Sea of Galilee. The land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Now, this is talking about the far northern regions of Israel, which, listen, nobody liked. It was the Gary, Indiana of Israel. (laughs) I apologize if you're from Gary, but in the 1990s, I would travel from Moody Bible Institute in downtown Chicago to Ohio quite regularly. I'd travel through Gary, Indiana, and I'd just say to myself, I cannot believe this place. I mean, it is full of pollution, abandoned warehouses, factories, abandoned homes, desolation, It was ranked back then the worst place to live in the United States. It had the highest murder rate. It had some of the lowest poverty rates in all of America. There are currently, even though there have been improvements, there are currently 13,000 abandoned structures in Gary, Indiana. 13,000. I wouldn't have even guessed there were that many homes. But that is... Gary, Indiana, and really that describes northern Israel. This was a despised place. Do you remember what, what, what Nathaniel said to Philip when Philip said, hey, come meet the Messiah, he's from Nazareth, and, 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 and what did Nathaniel say? Can anything good come from Nazareth? That's the northern regions of Israel. That's not the glorious place of Jerusalem. That's the dumpster fire of Israel. How can this be? And then look at the end of verse 1, where this region is called, what's it called? The very last statement there in verse 1, Galilee of the nations. Do you know why it's called that? Because of the pagan influence. They bordered these pagan lands where there was all of this transportation and all this commuting in that area, and and unbelievers and pagans would go through there and infiltrate that land, and it would become totally pagan influence. And so that's why it's called Galilee of the nations. It was the Gary, Indiana of Israel. And so that's why verse 1 says that it was brought into, what's it say? Brought into contempt, meaning shame. If you were from there, you were not proud that you were from there. And of course, of course, (laughs) this is where Jesus was born. And this is where Jesus began his ministry, is in this area God chose the worst place in all of Israel for his son to be born. And Matthew says this very specifically in chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Now when he had heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea. That's the northern regions that we've been talking about. In the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. So that was what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be filled. And then he goes on to quote the very verses that we're studying. Matthew does. Israel is going to go from shame to glory. Imagine having, you're the most shameful area in the whole nation and the most glorious being in all the universe. Not only is born there, but begins his ministry there. Unbelievable. Then he takes them from darkness to light. Darkness to light. From shame to glory. From darkness to light. Verse 2, look at what it says. Isaiah prophesies, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them has light shone. And when we think of light, we must think of God. Because 1 John chapter 1 says that God is light and in him there is no darkness. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. God doesn't just provide light. He is light, which is why the book of Revelation says there will be no sun, no blazing sun when God recreates the world because God himself will be the light because he is light. And light in scripture always represents two things. Number one, holiness. And number two, listen, revelation. Revelation. 
And so what Isaiah is saying to these people and prophesying to these people is that one day you are going to go from being confused and not understanding anything and not having the questions of your heart answered to knowing the truth and having the great questions of your heart. Is there a God? What is he like? What does he want from me? Is there an eternal life to be had? How can I have it? Men dwell in darkness. These are the questions that they have. And Isaiah says one day, It's going to come to you, this light, which is going to reveal these truths to you from darkness to light. Thirdly, from small to large, from small to large. This is just at the very beginning of verse 3, where Isaiah says, you have multiplied. Notion, he he didn't say you will multiply the nation. He says you have multiplied the nation. That, that's a, what theologians oftentimes refer to as the prophetic perfect tense. It's a way of talking about the future and prophesying, but you're, you're talking as if it's already happened because in God's mind, that's how certain it is. And so instead of saying you will multiply the nation of Israel, he says you have. It's already a done deal in God's mind. Now, what does he mean when he says you have multiplied the nation? Well, if you're to read Isaiah 26, 15, it says this, but you have increased the nation, O Lord. You have increased the nation. You are glorified. You have, listen to this, enlarged all the borders of the land. Now, this does not mean that God is promising that one day Israel is going to be the biggest nation and the best nation, and all the other nations are just going to be small and insignificant. That's not what this means. This means that God is one day going to make all the nations one nation, all the kingdoms one kingdom. You'll remember in Genesis chapter 17, 5, God promises to Abraham, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you, listen to this, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Abraham was not just the father of Israel. Abraham was the father of a multitude of nations where God makes all the nations into one nation, all the kingdoms into one kingdom. So the hope of Israel is not that God is going to destroy all the nations and they're going to be left to be his favorites. The hope of Israel is that they are going to be one with all the other nations, can you imagine? Can you imagine Israel and Palestine? One. Reconcile. Can you imagine? That's what this text says is going to happen one day when God enlarges, increases the nation and makes all the nations one under his rule and his reign. Fourthly, they're going to go from shame to glory, from darkness to light, from small to large, and then from sorrow to joy. From sorrow to joy. Look at the rest of verse 3. You have increased its joy. There's that past tense again, but he's talking about the future. <laughs> they rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. Isaiah says, your joy is going to be so much, it's going to be like the joy that farmers experience at the harvest. Now, I'm not a farmer. I can barely shuck corn. So I reached out to Dan Kuhlwine, who is a farmer. Many of you know him. And I asked him about this text, and I said, Dan, how do you feel about this? Uh, do you feel similar to this with this sort of joy at the harvest? Is it different in any way from you living in a modern time? And Dan wrote me back and he said, yeah, it's, it's a little bit different because, you know, if the harvest doesn't turn all that well, I can just go to Kroger. Um, but then he said this, I want to quote this to you. It is similar in that it is the culmination of basically an entire year's worth of work geared toward the process of producing that harvest. There is both a relief and satisfaction with seeing the fruit of all that labor. It is like a grand crescendo to be a part of it. It does, it does also have a communal aspect that would have been very similar to that culture as well, where your family and other farmers in your community share in it together. There's such a joy. Especially if that's how 
a modern farmer feels. How do you think an ancient farmer felt who didn't have a Kroger? That's what the joy is going to be like for the people of God one day. And in addition to that, it's going to be like the joy that people experience after a victorious war. That's why if you look in verse 3, it says they will divide the spoil. They will divide the spoil. That's because in those days when your nation went off to war with another nation and they defeated that nation, you got their stuff. You got their stuff. You took it all and you, you, you made them servants of your nation and you divided up all their stuff and you distributed it amongst your people. Can you imagine being in a nation and you're financially struggling as a family and you're thinking that maybe you're gonna have to submit your family to servitude and then your nation goes off to war. They win the war. They come back and guys throw like a three, three bars of gold at you. Imagine the joy. We don't have to sell ourselves to slavery to be servants of others. Imagine the joy that so many people had when they divided the spoils after a victorious war. That is what Israel's joy will be like. Now, the big question is this, why? Why? Why are they going to go from shame to glory, from darkness to light, from small to large, from sorrow to joy? Why? And the answer is this, because God is going to defeat all their enemies. Look at verse four. God is going to defeat all their enemies. For the yoke, here's the reason, four. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. Now, what does this, what does this mean? If you were to go to Isaiah chapter 10, scripture interprets, scripture interprets scripture, and Isaiah chapter 10, verse 24 says, be not afraid of the Assyrians, that was the nation that was going to attack them, be not afraid of the Assyrians when they strike with the rod and lift up their staff against you. And then in chapter 14, verse 25, he says, I will break the Assyrian in my land and trample him underfoot and his yoke shall depart from them. So God paints this picture of the Assyrians of having a rod and a staff and a yoke in chapter 10 and chapter 14. And those same three words are used in chapter nine, yoke, staff, rod. And remember what we learned last week, that the physical enemies of Israel What do they symbolize? Your and my spiritual enemies. The Old Testament is physical. The New Testament is spiritual. The Old Testament is pictures. The New Testament is fulfillment. These were pictures of things. These enemies that attacked Israel and surrounded Israel were just pictures of our enemies. And what are our enemies? Sin, spiritual enemy. Sin is our enemy. Suffering is our enemy. Death is our enemy. Satan is our enemy. These are our spiritual enemies that make our lives miserable. Sin sin makes our lives miserable, amen? And so does all the suffering that we endure from the sin of others and just living in this cursed world. And Satan and death makes our life miserable, but the, the prophecy here is God will defeat all of our enemies. It's not just talking about the Assyrians. It's talking about our spiritual enemies. And there are two reasons for this, that God defeats our enemies. Number one, he defeats our enemies for his glory. For his glory. Verse four. For you have broken, it says, talking about the enemy, as on the day of Midian. Of Midian. Now, do you, do you remember this story? In Judges chapter 7, this is the same region. In Judges chapter 7, with this battle at Midian, it's in the same region that Isaiah is prophesying to here. Gideon is the leader, and God goes to Gideon and he says, You got too many soldiers. You got 22,000 soldiers. That's, that's too many. Well, if you read the story, the story actually says that the opposing army, the Midianites and the Amalekites, had so many camels and so many soldiers that it looked like the sands of the seashore. That's how big their enemy's army was. It just went on for miles. It looked like the sand of the seashore and they have just a measly 22,000 and God says, I gotta scale it down. 
So he takes them to 10,000. And then God says, that's still not enough. And he scales them down to 300 men. And those 300 men surround this seashore of an army and they blow their trumpets and God causes mass confusion and chaos within the enemy camp. They start turning their swords against one another thinking they're being attacked by a massive army. God puts them in disarray and he defeats the enemy. And so the question becomes, why did God do it this way? Why did God scale their army to 300 men? Of course, we know the answer to that, don't we? So that he can get the glory for the victory. So that he can get the glory. God says to Isaiah, I'm going to defeat your enemy, and I'm going to do it in the way that I did it in Judges 7 through Gideon. I'm going to do it in such a way that you will see that this is due to me. Not you. Not your strength. Not your might. Not your righteousness. Not your ingenuity. I am going to do this in such a way to bring myself glory. So God defeats our enemies for his glory. But secondly, God defeats our enemies for our good. For our good. Verse 5. Verse 5. Isaiah chapter 9. Verse 5. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood, talking about their enemy's garments, will be burned as fuel for the fire. You say, how do you get God does things for our good based off of that verse? <laughs> well, if you were to read Ezekiel chapter 39, verses 9 through 10, let me just read this to you. Ezekiel 39, then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and make fires fires of the weapons, the weapons of their enemy, and burn them, shields and bucklers, bow and arrows, clubs and spears, and they will make fires of them, and it says, for seven years. And then he says this, so that you will not need to take wood out of the field or cut down any of the forests, of your forests. You're gonna defeat all of these enemies, and then I'm going to take all of the wood from their chariots and their spears and their swords. I'm going to take all that wood. There's going to be so much of it, you're not even going to need to cut down your forests. All of their weapons are going to be fuel for their fire. And this is a great picture of what God does with our enemies. Listen, he doesn't just defeat them for us. He repurposes them. And he uses our enemies as our servants he uses our enemies to serve us. That is why, and I've mentioned this before back in Romans, you remember that we are called more than conquerors. How can you be more than a conqueror? I mean, conqueror is great just by itself. We conquered. A lot more than conquerors because those days, like I just got done saying, you didn't just defeat a nation, you took their stuff. You made them your servants. More than conquerors. Oftentimes, you know, you and I, Here's what we do. We interpret all of the bad things that happen to us, all of the difficult things that happen to us. We oftentimes interpret that as God is displeased with me. God must be upset with me. He's turned his back against me. Why isn't he helping me? Why are these bad things and we interpret the bad things, the difficult things, the hard things, as God being displeased with us. And Romans 8 says, no, 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 you, you've got it all wrong. You've got it all wrong. No, no, the bad things are not separating you from the love of God. God is using your enemies. God is using your suffering, using these bad things that have happened to you for your good. He's taking your enemies and he's repurposing them. He's making them fuel for the fire. And so therefore, sin. Does sin have consequences? Yes, it does. I'm not saying it doesn't. But what else does sin do? It humbles us, doesn't it? Well, that's a perfect example of how God takes our enemies and repurposes them and uses them to serve us for our good. The very sin with which we sin, we are crushed by, are we not? We feel convicted by. And what that does is it ends up humbling us and enabling us to treat each other with grace because we do the same things. Or think about death. 
Death is painful. We're not going to deny that. I'm not going to stand up here and say that death isn't sorrowful, that you shouldn't have any sort of sorrow in your heart when someone dies that you love. But what does death ultimately do? Death is the doorway into the presence of Christ. It ushers us into the presence of Christ. Our enemies are now our servants. Or think about suffering. No one is going to say that suffering isn't hard. Suffering is hard. But what does it also do? It makes us more like Christ. So God repurposes our enemy. He makes them fuel for the fire. He uses all of that for our good. And so this leads to the final question, how? The first one was why. The second one is how. How will this happen? How can, or how can, how can God take an idolatrous, evil, corrupt, murderous people and defeat the enemies for them? to help them to make their lives eternally blissful. How is that possible? We're killing children. We have blood on our hands. We're selfish. We're hateful. We do all these things that we are convicted of. Why in the world would God do this for us? Answer, verse six. For to us, A child is born. There's the explanation again. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Do you know how God can make it all right? How God can say it's all going to change, and there's hope for you despite being under my judgment, despite everything you've done. Do you know why God can say that? Because he gave us his son. And maybe the most beautiful words in that verse are to us. For unto us a son is given. He's given to us. He's given, listen, he's a gift. Jesus Christ is a gift from God, given to you, given to me. The Holy One of Israel, who in Isaiah chapter 6 is enthroned with the cherubim and the seraphim, crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. This Holy One who was enthroned like that (laughs) becomes a child. The God of the universe becomes a child who, listen, according to this verse, grows into a man and becomes a child a leader. The government is upon his shoulders. He takes the responsibility of leadership. Praise God, right? That is so rare. Most leaders, it's like, okay, I'm getting into this because I, for my own fame, my own glory, for what I can get out of it. Not this leader. This leader is unlike any political leader or spiritual leader we have ever known. And that is the point here of this verse. First of all, he is wonderful Counselor. Wonderful counselor. You know that word wonderful in the Hebrew? The word wonderful doesn't do it justice. I mean, the word wonderful is wonderful, but it, it doesn't do it justice. It really should be interpreted extraordinary or something that is extremely out of the ordinary, something unlike you have ever seen. In other words, Isaiah is saying that this counselor, when he comes and he counsels you and he instructs you and he teaches you, it's gonna be unlike anything you have ever seen. And that's what the gospels testify to, right? All the gospels testify to the fact that when Jesus Christ came, he spoke, it says, in a way that no other man had ever spoken Nobody's teachings, nobody's words compares to the teachings and the counsel and the guidance and the words of Jesus Christ. The Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, the discourse in the upper room about loving God and loving one another, there's nothing like it that the world has ever seen. He is the world's great counselor. And there is more wisdom in one paragraph spoken by Jesus than there is 10 million books by the greatest thinkers and philosophers of our time. He is the wonderful, way out of the ordinary counselor. Psalm 73, 24 says, you guide me with your counsel. And then Psalm 32, 8 says, I will counsel you with my eye upon you. And wow, what a comforting verse. 
you know that the Lord's eye is always upon you. <laughs> to do you good, to counsel you, to instruct you, don't go there, don't go down that path. Instead, do this, say this. He's constantly guiding, has his eye on you, and is continually counseling you. Do you know that? He's the wonderful counselor. Secondly, he's mighty God. Mighty God. <laughs> now, in the Hebrew, it's two separate words, El Gabor. El Gabor. And Gabor means mighty or strong. It, has, it really refers to like a, a, a hero in war, a valiant warrior. And it says El Gabor. And I want to explain the significance to you of the fact that in the Hebrew, the words are separated. It's El separation, Gabor. I want to explain the significance of that. Sometimes the word El is a part of a name. It either comes at the beginning of a name or the end of a name. For example, Samuel, Ishmael, Israel. Or sometimes it comes at the beginning of a name, Elijah, El Yad. But every time it does that with a human name, listen, they're not separated, they're together as one word. Anytime the word El is used in reference to God, it's separated. So El, separation, Shaddai. El, separation, El Yon. El, separation, Gabor. So there are some Jewish interpreters that say, oh, this just refers to a mighty warrior who's going to come and, and, and help Israel. No. It is explicit in the Hebrew, that this is a name of God, mighty God, mighty God. Thirdly, everlasting Father, everlasting Father. Jesus, listen, the Son of God is everlasting Father, which is a bit confusing for those of us who believe in the Trinity because we know as Christians that the Son is not the Father, and the Father is not the Son, and the Father is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. They are one, but they are distinct persons. This is Christianity 101 when it comes to the Trinity. They are one God, yet they are distinct three persons. The Father's not the Son. The Son's not the Father. So how can this verse say that Jesus, the Son, is the everlasting Father? Let me give you some options. Number one, one explanation is that it was common to refer to kings in those days as Father. Think about it. Even in America, George Washington is the Father of our nation. And that was the case in the ancient Near East. The kings were known as fathers. And so this could be a reference to Jesus as king, father of the nation. But more than likely, this is a reference, listen to this, to Jesus, listen, birthing a new humanity. Jesus birthing a new humanity. You'll remember, we've learned many times, Adam was our first father, and he's the father of the old humanity. Jesus Christ is our second father of the new humanity. Listen to Isaiah. This is, this is you know, the pieces are coming together for Isaiah. And later in chapter 53, verse 10, it says, when his soul makes an offering for guilt, meaning Jesus, when he's been sacrificed on the cross, after that has happened and he's raised from the dead, he shall see his offspring, his offspring, Jesus' offspring, the new humanity, and he shall prolong his days. But thirdly, thirdly, this is in line with the fact that, listen, you can be a father to someone spiritually, right? Isn't that why Paul said to Timothy, he called him what? My son. You can be a father to someone. You evangelize them. You bring them to the faith. You raise them up in the faith. You disciple them. You become their father. You become their mother. Did you know that? 
You can become a spiritual mother and father to someone. And so Jesus is our spiritual father as well. And so the point here is that Jesus' leadership, this son who was given to us, is unlike any other because he's not going to be domineering. He's not going to be dictatorial. He's going to be, listen, father-like, caring, loving, gentle, guiding, joyful, focused on your needs, not himself. This is the type of leadership that Jesus does bring and will bring in the end. It's a fatherly leadership. Fourthly, fourthly, he is the prince of peace. He's the prince of peace. You know, when we think of peace, what do we normally think of? Inner tranquility, right? I just want to be at peace. <laughs> and certainly, that's what this entails. But the Hebrew word is shalom. And shalom, shalom entails more than just inner tranquility. Shalom entails everyone being right with one another and everything being restored. So when you think of the Hebrew word shalom, think of the word reconciliation and think of the word restoration. Shalom isn't just an inner tranquility that we will experience. Shalom is being reconciled to God and as a result of being reconciled to God, being reconciled to one another. Peace, not just peace in my heart, but peace with God. And as a result of being at peace with God, being at peace with man. Jesus reconciles us to God. He is the only one, listen, the only one who can reconcile us to God. If you're having trouble in your relationships, war in your relationships, it's most likely because you're at war with God. If you're not reconciled in your relationships here, it's because we're not reconciled in our relationship there. That's the key. So Jesus is going to bring together Jew and Gentile, black and white, rich and poor, male and female, parents and children, and he is going to one day reconcile all of them because he is the Prince of Shalom, the Prince of Peace. And the best news about all of this is that this wise, loving, caring, strong, divine, fatherly leader is going to do this, listen to this, forever. It's never going to end. Look at verse 7. Of the increase of his government and of the peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and what? Forevermore. No more corruption. No more injustice in this world. No more suffering God and man will be one. Man and man will be one. And because there was an infant in a manger, there is now a king on a throne. And it is important to understand, it is important to understand that he is the one who did this, not us. And it is important to understand that he did this because he was passionate about reconciliation with God and us being reconciled with one another and having us live for He was passionate about that, not us. Look at verse seven, the very end of verse seven. What's it say? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. It is because of God's passion that this will happen, not our passion. If it was left up to us, we want what? Chaos, corruption, we want authority. We want God off the throne, Christ off the throne. And we want to be on the throne ourselves and be the gods of our own universe. And it is because man wanted to become God that God had to become man. And it's also important to understand that this shalom, this eternal reign, listen, final thought, this shalom, this eternal reign, this new world of eternal bliss and peace, it is not offered to everyone. It is only given, it is offered to all, but it is only given to those who repent. You have to go to God and you have to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry for my sins. I ask you to forgive me. And I forsake myself. And I receive your gift, the son that you've given to me. God will give his eternal kingdom to all those. And if you do that, John chapter 1 says, he will give you the right to become the children of God. And so we can say that God became the child of a man so that men could become the children of God. Won't you come? Won't you come? Make this the best Christmas you've ever had. (laughs) Be reconciled to your creator. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we celebrate the gift of your son this morning who heals our relationships, who stretches out his hand between us and God and brings us together, who stretches out his hand between Jew and Palestinian and brings them together. Thank you for creating this shalom. Thank you for this prophecy, which is so certain it is spoken of as if it has already happened. What certainty we have, Lord. We thank you for that. This, this Christ child, this God enthroned, holy, 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 in a manger. Help us to humble ourselves as you were willing to humble yourself. Help us to serve as you were willing to serve. We worship you, Lord Jesus, the Son given to us, wonderful counselor, mighty God. Amen.